Welcome to another episode here on Tax FM. It's Business Talk with myself, Lennox Wasara. As always, we're bringing you the special guests who will bring you insight about what's really happening in the world that can also help us prepare ourselves for our careers. Today, I'm joined by a special lady, Vumile Msweli. She's an international speaker. She's a renowned career coach. She's a founder and chief executive of Herse Consulting, a pan-African consulting firm specializing in coaching and also human capital management, facilitating that uh, recruitment and training conversation on the African continent. She's uh, certainly a renowned businesswoman. She's achieved so much. But also her resume is just full of many accolades of the things that she's been able to achieve. But most importantly, she is probably where you're at right now. She was at some point a tax student, uh, studied at the University of Pretoria, got involved with the SRC and many student societies at the time to upskill herself. And uh, certainly that's uh, paid a lot of dividends as uh, her career has really shot off in the right trajectory. So thank you for joining today, uh, Vumi, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Lennox, and hello to your listeners. Phenomenal. I mean, let's uh, just want to take you back a little bit to your journey at the University of Pretoria. You started uh, doing accounting sciences and how was the experience? How has it shaped you to be the powerful woman that you are? I think it was probably the biggest culture shock of my life. So I'm exposing my age now. But I went, I had gone to high school at St. Mary's in, um, in KZN. And I really hadn't even heard of Afrikaans spoken. So you can imagine the first day of university, your parents leave and they're all sweet. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's yours, it's for hard luck. And I was like, you take up, what is going on here? So needless to say, it was a massive culture shock. But I loved, I loved being at the University of Pretoria. Um, I was in Erika, I was Haka, I did uh, SRC, Panda Bay, I got involved in everything. And I think I really enjoyed the communal sort of feeling and community feeling that I had at Tux. I went from, um, of course, coming from a boarding school to something a little bit similar, but very different, a little bit more independence, which I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. And I think, of course, you know, the studies were hard. Um, I think everyone who knows FRK 100, if you still, if it's still called that, was a trauma to the mind and the soul. But I think that really started uh, planting the seeds that helped me um, really start understanding the need to persevere. That once you commit to something, try and work as hard as you can, you may never be the best at it. But the ability to persevere will often stand you in good stead compared to your competitors. Absolutely. I mean... Uh, your your journey now, you are doing so many things at the same time now. I am fascinated to hear a little bit more about, I mean, you're still studying, you're currently doing a PhD, but uh, let's talk a little bit more about wearing multiple hats. Uh, how have you found the time to juggle all of that? So it's a bit of a challenge, but, you know, I'm a career coach and we live in the gig economy, meaning that we have to get comfortable in being agile and adaptable in what it is that we do. There's an element of my business is, of course, recruiting, career coaching. I'm a speaker. Um, a lot of people don't know this. I'm into property. I own, I own several stores as well. I still on a number of things that I own within business. But it's the ability to put on different hats and be agile because the revenue and the dividends that pay out on different businesses are a little bit different. And I remember, you know, learning that the importance of diversification and in income, specifically when you're an entrepreneur. And I come from a family that's quite entrepreneurial. So I remember I left university, my first job, I rented, I think for like four months and I was getting ready. And my, my grandfather was like, you pay rent. Like it was despicable. You better get an apartment. And, I, and then that's how quickly I bought one. Like I had my first property at the age of 22. But that's, that's wow. really started shifting things for me as to you have to diversify your income. And a lot of us think that, you know, the process of making money is all about hard work and it's only one, one tunnel vision. And that's not how the world works now. The world works in a manner where you have to diversify, you know, even what it is that you're doing and how it is that you're doing and where it is that you're doing. That's why even what I do with career coaching, we've got, we've got presence in Nigeria, Botswana, Rwanda, the U.S to make sure that we, we're really um, hedging ourselves against any risk that could potentially occur in South Africa. Then we know, ah, it's fine, we'll make some money in Nigeria. Ah, it's fine, we'll make some money in the US. Absolutely, that's very interesting. I mean, having your first property at 22, um, that's, uh, that must seem, that's really phenomenal. I don't hear that too often, but uh, really cool and uh, I guess in, encouraging in many ways. But with your work now, you're doing a lot of career consulting. Let's talk about, you know, somebody, you know, thinking, you know, I really like this career, but I actually don't 
know how I can integrate it because one of the main challenges we find ourselves in now is that there's a high unemployment rate. So sometimes the career that you wish to go into is literally occupied. There's people there already and they have a lot more experience than you do. So uh, what what is the way forward for us as young people? Yeah, so we live in South Africa, right? Highest unemployment for people between the ages of 18 and 35. I'm, I'm slowly leaving that 35 youth bracket, so I know how rough it is. Um, so 34% of us are, are unemployed. When there's unemployment, I think we can take a leaf from our brothers in West Africa, where they had high unemployment. But what increased is entrepreneurship and really starting to create what we call self-employment. So yes, you wanna go into a particular industry, you don't have the experience. Sometimes to get into the industry you want, you have to be willing to take a kickback and take volunteering. You know, when I was getting into coaching, the amount of hours I spent volunteering my time and engaging other coaches to give me the exposure I needed to build my business. That's the first thing. The second thing is, in an economy like South Africa, where sometimes we have survival entrepreneurs, people doing whatever it takes in order to put food on the table, we often forget that we should also bring an element of, um, of, of our passion to what it is that we do. And people always ask me, do we passion over purse? And I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think you can do both. It's so, so important that, you know, we are mm -hmm. able to create work that gives us joy, even in the face of unemployment. You know, if I, well, you know, that's why I guess I did my TED talk, help, I hate my job, because there's so many people who are employed but hate what it is that they do so you're not wanting that scenario either so one if you are unemployed and there aren't those opportunities you have to be then responsible for your career and create those opportunities it's very rare that someone's going to say oh please welcome to the c-suite let me help you in you have to create that for yourself um, that's one aspect of it the second aspect is the job and, and exposure you can get how is that leveraging your career strategy See, I started at the call center. That was not my career plan. I thought I was going to become a chartered accountant. And starting at the call center wasn't the ideal place, I thought, but I realized it was the best place I could learn the skills I needed to get to where I wanted to be as, a, as an entrepreneur 10 years later when I left corporate. I learned how to problem solve. I learned how to build relationships. Um, I learned how to, to engage clients. And it was actually my client who recommended me. And I went from call center agent to, you know, head of business support sitting in the UK. And that's all because of how I learned the skill of relationship building and career positioning. So wherever it is that you find yourself, take that opportunity and let it be a stepping stone to your next level. Um, it's the only way you really can catapult yourself to where it is that you're wanting to be in your career. Phenomenal, because I listen to that and I think I hear conversations about people, young professionals who have in some way managed to get a job and they're excited, but not so long into the job, six months, nine months, uh, perhaps a year into the job, one starts to hate it, as you mentioned, um, resent the work, but it pays the bills. So they sort of get stuck in the cycle and also perhaps one's got a bit of debt. So uh, it really becomes a little bit uh, rigid for them to exercise that flexibility you're talking about. So what is your word to somebody who might be in that space? I mean, I know you mentioned talking about creating opportunities and creating opportunities for oneself through self-employment, through being entrepreneurial. Quite sounds good, but I mean, practically it's uh, difficult. It's the daunting task. It is a daunting task. And if you find yourself in a job that you hate, I would say 80% of the time, it's due to the fact that you actually didn't have a career strategy. A lot of us leave um, corporate. I mean, we leave a university and we take the first job that comes along because we need a job. At no point do we stop and say, okay, what is the career strategy? If you've studied accounting, um, you know, actual science, law, you're lucky because you've got a plan laid out for you for several years. You do your articles and then you, you know, you pass your board exams and then and then what's next? So a lot of us who are, for example, in other spaces where there are no articles, it's great, but this is not what I wanted. And the reason you can say that is you never actually knew what it is that you wanted. So you have to go back to the drawing board and create a career strategy. And knowing what it is that you don't want isn't knowing what it is that you want. What do I mean? If I go to a restaurant and I say, oh, I don't want chicken. What does that mean? Do I want steak? Do I want lamb? Do I feel for pizza or pasta? It doesn't really articulate where it is that I'm wanting to go and what it is that I want to experience. So the first step for me is if you're finding yourself in a job that you don't like, if you're finding yourself stuck in a room, I don't even know where to start, what is your career strategy? 
I was able to stay in the call center for over three years, even when there were moments where I was like, oh, I'm good, actually, I'm not going to want to do this anymore, because I had a clear career strategy. So I could hold on longer and create opportunities where I was because I knew what my strategy was and where it was that I was going. So I knew, okay, I'm staying here, but I need to make sure I connect with these guys in marketing. It's a skill I need in order to be successful as an entrepreneur in seven years time. So you not having a plan is going to get you frustrated and annoyed. When you have a plan, it makes it easier to bear. If you think back to high school, you hated maths. It was awful. But you hang on because you're like, I'm going to be a tux. I'm going to be a tux and this will all be over soon. Exact same principle applies when looking at your career. That's that's really cool. Um, I like the fact that, you know, you just have to stick it through if you have a plan, not just because you don't have a plan. And uh, perhaps, uh, obviously, sometimes one is unsure about what it is it is exactly that they wish to do. So sometimes formulating that plan can be a bit of a challenge. So uh, I do imagine, I guess, somewhat this plan is linked to goals that one sets in some way. Yeah, so the goals are, so if you're thinking of a, a formulating a career strategy, it's, it's almost like a long-term objective and experience. So it's very, you know, this is what I do for a living is help people formulate these. Then we break it down to what has to happen in the midterm and then what has to happen in the short term. So if you're thinking, for example, um, someone's strategy, which might be, you know, I want to be the CEO of a financial institution versus someone says, I want to be an entrepreneur. Their career strategies, even though they're both sitting at the call center, as they start, are fundamentally different. One is going into deep dive into understanding the organization at its various levels because they need that information to succeed ahead. The other is not going to deep dive. They're going to try to be more generalist and get exposure to as many different divisions as possible in order to be successful when they run their own business. So you can see that the strategies are a little bit different. And the challenge where a lot of us battle is we've never actually had these conversations. Um, and we've never even had these conversations with our parents because they never had a career strategy. Their strategy was get a job and just hold on till the very end. Um, so, so that's why you need to be able to get conversations going with things like mentorship, you know, the, the, the mentorship boardroom, I know you have chatted to Yolanda about things like that. Getting mentorship helps you formulate your strategy. Getting a sponsor helps you formulate your strategy. Getting a coach helps you formulate your strategy. So there are a number of tools that you use. And the reality is that in varsity, some of us haven't even thought about the career strategy. We're just trying to survive second year. That's all you're trying to do. Like you, please, it's spring day, may I be here again next year. That's all in essence that's happening. But as you are winding into your third year and you're realizing or your postgrad, you really need to start thinking. And it starts with even where it is that you apply and who do you apply to? Which, which institutions do you choose to go to after university? Which, um, that can be academic or it can be uh, corporate or it can be in the public sector. Where are you going? Where are you studying posters? So for me, for example, you know, um, getting that exposure outside of South Africa became very, very important. I, and I'm still studying. I just finished, you know, I just graduated at Harvard. So all of those become very, very important if you know your strategy. And if you don't know where to start, start getting the people who can assist you. That mentor, that sponsor, that coach. Very true. I mean, um, that does make a lot of sense. And I think, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of the people, I mean, I know for myself, just trying to get through that module. So one gets loses track. So hopefully this conversation would help uh, folks to start thinking beyond just getting through that uh, difficult module. And let's talk a little bit more about, all right, I find myself in the career, in the, in the path that I wish to be in. And maybe I've got mentors and so forth, but I really want to accelerate that process. I want to get some speed going into getting closer to the career goal that I wish to have. Any tips on how to speed things up? I love this question. We're actually in the middle of a career acceleration program in our organization and it's a two month program. So what I'm gonna to say to you, just remember, we go in depth for two months. The first aspect in career acceleration is a lot of people, and you won't realize this now, but when you start working, you might start adopting the belief that your work will speak for itself. It doesn't. Corporate, and I'm saying this clearly, corporate is a game. If you don't know the rules of the game, you will forever be stuck. You will think it's tennis. Meanwhile, it's football. And then you're thinking, but why are people picking up the ball? Oh, at this level, it transforms into rugby. So if you don't understand corporate politics, how to play the game, how to eloquently position and speak for yourself, 
you will find yourself very often frustrated in your role and not accelerating. The second thing is, well, the, a big mistake I see a lot of my young grads do is they come in with the technical expertise. I'm technically competent, but they don't have the experience. And even in your acceleration, the experience and exposure you choose to get to, your, to give yourself determines where in corporate you go. There's a reason some people are, you know, in corporate for three years and then similar to me, by, year, by age of 24, you're sitting at extended exco reporting to the CEO, while some people 10 years later are still have never met the CEO. It's because they don't understand the rules of the game. Now you're going to say to me, Vumi, what are the rules? Tell me off the top, rules. Top. I was getting there. <laughs> Um, and every organization and every industry has a little bit of different tailored rules. So the tip I can give you is start studying. When you get to corporate, study the politics of the organization. Some organizations, you know, where I started in a private bank, it was very abrupt, in your face, party hard, work hard. I was in the office at nine o'clock. By five o'clock, the drinks are coming out. So if you didn't know how to be sociable and, and grab that Savannah and, and chat to the CEO, you got stuck. If you did know, you succeeded. Those rules worked well in that particular organization. Then fast forward several years, I'm sitting in the UK. I can't implement those same rules because how things worked in, that, in, the, in the British institution were different. So you sit back for those three months and you're literally studying who, who, the, who, who are the people who are succeeding, what are they doing? And you, you then start replicating that. And often one of the best places to start are the relationships. People do business with people they like. If they don't like you, they're not going to vouch for you. They're not going to vouch for you. You're going to stay where you are. Now you're going to say to me, how do I get people to like you? You have to join my career accelerator program. Sorry. People pay money for that information. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, well, I think that does uh, uh, bring a bit of a nuance, uh, I must say, in terms of really just how one should go about uh, their career. Uh, quite an interesting perspective that your hard work will always speak for you. So you have to uh, wiggle around the situation differently, understanding office politics. So uh, that's relatively interesting. But uh, before I let you go, I guess um, I got to ask you this question uh, that they always ask people that are very insightful as to what is it that one thing that you wish you knew then when you're starting off your career journey that you know now? Um. I think for me, I wish I knew how to negotiate better in the beginning. You know, in the beginning, I was so grateful to have a job I didn't negotiate, not realizing every time you sign a contract, you, that is the base with which you start. My friends who negotiated harder getting out the gate got this much, which means their starting point was higher. So fast forward five years, they're naturally more ahead and they naturally are earning more. And money, you know, is very, very important. There's a reason the Bible says money is the answer to all things. Money is important and it's an energy that allows you access to open different things. So I think for me, the art of negotiation, I would have mastered that a lot earlier on in my career because it, um, it made my career in the latter years a lot easier once I mastered it. Because it's not just about the money, it's about who's paying for your MBA, where are you going to go work? Once I mastered that, I was like, oh, me, work in South Africa. How about I meet you in Dusseldorf, Germany or Singapore? And all of a sudden it exposed me more because I had mastered the art of negotiating. So what I wish I knew earlier was how to negotiate a little bit better for myself. All right, uh, that's interesting because I thought about something now around when you're sitting perhaps in an interview with your potential employer, the conversation around money can be quite difficult. Uh, any tips on how students can maybe navigate that turf when they do find themselves sitting in front of, of an executive trying to negotiate their salary? Uh, what, what, what can, how can you handle that like a boss? Okay, so one of the things you're wanting to do is avoid talking about it until you know there's an offer on the table. Remember when you get an offer, it's an offer. It's not a must take. So one of the simple questions I always um, ask, and I think next week when the mentorship boardroom on their social media, um, I'll, I'll be talking around this. And I talk about this as well um, in, my, in my Instagram live lessons every single Monday where I talk about various career topics. The simple question is, can we do better? When you get the offer, just ask, can we do better? Is this the best we can do? It is a small and the worst they can say is no, unfortunately our budget is tight. But just simply asking that 
opens up conversations that ordinarily people don't think about. Because also we think the only way, uh, the only cost of company of the remuneration is solely around our salary and it's not. Organizations pay in various ways. I remember trying to leave an organization and that's how they ended up paying for me to study in New York. And that's the money I didn't have. But when I came back with that qualification, all of a sudden my, my value to the markets tripled because people like, you studied at Stern Business School? Yes. And I couldn't have paid for that, but the returns were the same as if they were better than if they had given me the money in cash. So that's something I want you to think about is asking the question, is this the best we can do? That's very helpful. Um, hopefully that would uh, benefit everybody listening and watching. Um, Sirli, I wish I could speak with you all day. I wish you could have this over a bonfire, but it's not the case. I learned so much from your insights and uh, it was so great for you to be connecting with your alma mater, the, that of the University of Pretoria. Thank you so much for having me, Lennox. Stay safe, everybody. Incredible. As you heard it, that comes through from Bumisweli, who is quite a phenomenal lady who's pushing the envelope, really doing exceptional work. As you heard uh, that uh, she really is passionate about career related issues. She is a career coach, but also she's uh, the chief executive officer and founder of Hersia Consulting. And hopefully this will help you and in some way, shape or form. But if you do wish to connect with her, uh, you can also check her out on social media. But uh, till we meet again, it's nothing but love and light on my side. Goodbye.